Okay, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is our first hybrid seminar uh, in what feels like, I don't know, an eternity. Um, and we're really hoping that we'll have more of these going forward, of course, within the bounds of the pandemic. Um, so for anyone who's new to the seminar series, the CPAR seminar provides a forum for presenting and discussing state-of-the-art research findings in HIV pathogenesis, virology, care, and treatment, and to provide an opportunity for ongoing enhanced communication and multidisciplinary collaboration among HIV AIDS researchers across the five CFAR affiliated institutions and their partner organizations. Um, we hope you'll continue to join us for these the seminars. The next one will be in January, January 13th. Um, it'll be at a different time, it's eight o'clock in the morning, and it'll be via Zoom only. And our speaker is Moses Maya from uh, Monterey University. And now I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lyle McKinnon. Dr. McKinnon did his PhD at the University of Manitoba and his postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto, both focused on the cellular immunology of HIV transmission and pathogenesis. He's currently an associate professor in medical microbiology and infectious diseases at the University of Manitoba. And he also has appointments at CAPRISA, the University of Nairobi and Public Health Agency of Canada. His research interests include understanding the causes and consequences of inflammation in the female genital tract, HIV target cells, including those that home to the gut, and HIV transmission and acute infection in MSM in Kenya and Thailand. The goal of his, of his work is to understand how host immunology can contribute to HIV prevention efforts. So I know that there's um, many of us who are um, very interested uh, in what, what their group does. Um, his lab also studies factors influencing the coastal barrier integrity and function, including the immune regulation of host interactions with commensal microbiota and fundamental aspects of CD4 positive uh, T cell biology. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing your talk and the first um, in person guest uh, for the year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. One last thing. Danielle asked me to remind everybody who's here to please sign in uh, before you leave. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, every time I hear it, I always want to make a mental note that I should make it shorter. So I don't have to listen to it very long. But uh, anyway, it's very nice to be here. It's very nice to be somewhere besides uh, Winnipeg. Um, I'm happy to give this talk today. So, um, my lab focuses on um, really trying to understand the mucosal immune correlates of HIV acquisition. And there's a central role, central focus on, uh, on inflammation and how inflammation is regulated. And this is what I'll spend most of today talking about. But we also do some epidemiological studies, and I'll just present uh, one example of those. Uh, but because we uh, are interested in human immunology, I think it's really important to, to link biological studies to the, to the underlying epi and, under, and understand HIV transmission in context. So that's why we try to uh, pair these two uh, different approaches. And because we work in cohorts uh, in various places, we, we try to understand the epi of those cohorts at the same time we understand the immunology. And then I'll, I'll just talk a little bit at the end on some uh, some COVID research that we got involved in, even though we try to avoid it. Um, so I, I've been involved in, in some key population programming in Nairobi over the years uh, when I was based there as a student and a postdoc, and I still collaborate with. Uh, the Sex Worker Outreach Program, uh, which was established in 2008 uh, to really provide um, prevention and treatment uh, uh, to both female sex workers and MSM, many of whom are uh, cell sex to men. So we've, pu we've published some papers on, on, on these groups, uh, looking at prevalence, incidence, uh, and risk factors. Uh, we've also recently published the, the time trends in HIV prevalence, showing a, a decline over time. And this really has, has grown into a, a very large program with more than 30,000 uh, women who have been uh, ever enrolled and uh, several thousand men as well. We also have some, some data on geographic trends, both uh, within Kenya uh, and within Nairobi. And this is some, some work that we're working on publishing uh, now. But there is a lot of heterogeneity, obviously, both by where people come from uh, in Kenya uh, as, as a predictor of prevalence and where, where women work within uh, which hotspots within Nairobi. But I'm just going to spend a couple of slides talking about some new data we've generated on sexual, sexual networks uh, using HIV phylogenetic approaches. Um, so 
basically what we did is we started banking samples that are, are taken for viral load or CD4 measurements. Uh, we started in 2016 and we're, and uh, this is analyzing data from about three years, uh, collections ongoing. So we've had uh, about 700 female sex worker sequences, uh, samples, sorry. And close to two thirds of those, we were able to amplify HIV out of. Obviously people, a lot of people are, on, uh, are suppressed on, on, on therapy and you can't get sequences from everybody. And then a similar story for, for a smaller number of MSM. And really the objective here is, is a, a PhD student of mine called Frank Cholette, is to determine network overlap and characteristics within an intensively sampled small geographic area in a, in a relatively narrow time frame. So these dots here are showing, this is a map of Nairobi, and these dots are showing where hotspots are located. And, and most of the people were sampling uh, a work out of these hotspots that are right in the middle of the city. So the idea was that you have to have people that are likely to be interacting to be able to detect they're in, in the same sexual network or not. And so in, in, in an analysis of these sequences, we've used two different genetic cutoffs. So uh, less than 2.5% uh, sequence similarity and less than 4.5. We found that quite a few sequences clustered. And this is just showing the, the clusters here on the right. But about 13% of, of the sequences clustered using this more stringent cutoff and about 38% if you use a, a, a slightly less stringent cutoff. We're currently using, uh, we're currently doing some fancier sort of evolutionary analyses, but this is just the, the initial analysis we did. You can see that um, MSM sequences, perhaps not surprisingly, are more likely to cluster than female sex workers. And more people, uh, a higher proportion cluster if you use the less stringent cutoff. But what was interesting for us and what we really wanted to address is, is whether the clusters were mostly exclusive or, or mostly mixed. And then the answer in both of these different analyses is that we find a lot of mixed clusters. So basically um, at the 2.5% genetic cutoff, almost half the clusters are mixed, uh, suggesting or meaning that they have a, both a, a MSM or a male sex worker and a female sex worker in that cluster. And uh, that becomes e uh, even more pronounced when you look at a, a less string, stringent cutoff. And, uh, and then the other thing is that you, as you decrease the stringency, you tend to find larger and larger um, uh, networks as well. So this is just a quick uh, look at this uh, initial data we have, but suggesting that female sex workers in MSM and Nairobi may share sexual networks. And this was evident by sequencing HIV in individuals who are likely to interact with each other. And actually this is congruent with some anecdotal accounts, which made us do this analysis in the first place, that in that uh, a lot of men and women go go to the same hotspots and potentially have clients that, uh, that overlap, um, suggesting that the networks overlap. And I think the phylogenetic analysis supports the, the, those anecdotal accounts. We're currently now doing some comparisons of those within and, and not within networks, and also comparing the exclusive and, and the mixed clusters to understand the profile of people that are in, in one or the other. Uh, we also want to expand this work. So we work, we're continually taking samples. So we should be able to understand how networks are changing during COVID. And we've recently published a couple of, uh, of review articles uh, uh, basically documenting that the, the looks like the networks could change dramatically because the, the nature of sex work uh, changed dramatically and nightlife in general in Nairobi changed dramatically with the COVID uh, lockdowns. And we also have an ethics project with uh, Rob Lorway, who's an anthropologist I work with, and, and, and really in collaboration with the committees in Nairobi. And the idea here is really to understand what these data can be used for. So can we design interventions based on these data? And, and what's the, what are the communities, what is their perceptions of the data? And, and can they provide any additional insights uh, that, uh, that can be generated and that can lead to some kind of intervention? So I think this is kind of an exciting project I wanted to share just briefly. Um, obviously, this is not the main thing I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so the, the rest of the talk will be more on, on immunology. So, um, a lot of my lab uh, focuses on, on, on inflammation, and this was just featured in last week's uh, uh, issue of Science. And there's this really nice review by Ruslan Mesotov that uh, talks about inflammation on, on a spectrum, because obviously aspects of inflammation are important for uh, regular homeostasis, but uh, the, these things can spin out of control sometimes in, in chronic inflammatory diseases. And he also, he also draws attention to, to how inflammation is defined and how pe different people think of inflammation in, in, in different ways. So what we've done is a series of studies looking at genital inflammation in women. And we define inflammation using a nine cytokine sort of STI signature. So these are all cytokines and chemokines that increase during bacterial STIs. And they're listed here on the screen. Uh, we found a dose-dependent uh, 
association between um, upregulation of these cytokines. So having more cytokines in the upper quartile of, of the distribution led to a higher uh, hazard ratio for HIV acquisition. Why the screen just turned off. I guess I can keep talking anyways. Um, the, uh, this also, women with inflammation also had decreased uh, topical PrEP efficacy. And this was in the, in the Tenofovir gel trial. Um, and then women with inflammation were also infected with less fit viruses. And I think that kind of uh, suggests that the virus finds an easier way to, to get in if, if inflammation is present. And, and, and uh, this shouldn't be surprising to a lot of people. So this is, this is sort of a classic uh, cartoon of what happens during inflammation. So you get uh, a, bit, a breakdown of mucosal barriers, you get an influx of, uh, of immune cells. And in some cases, this can lead to clinical, clinically noticeable inflammation, such as discharge or, or redness or swelling. Uh, but in other cases, it can be it can be subclinical, and that's what the cytokine signature picks up. And uh, we really do think that the cytokines are, are actually just biomarkers for some of these other other processes, which may may themselves be sort of mechanisms of HIV transmission. So, at the same time, we're studying inflammation. I, I'm I'm really gen, uh, um, getting interested in what regulates inflammation. And there's this interesting review written a few years ago by Yasmin Belkate, Timothy Hand on, on this mucosal firewall concept. And the, the, the idea here is do we ignore or respond to external stimuli and, and how is this regulated and, and what are the consequences? And the important thing here is that you can't just shut the door at a mucosal barrier because in, information exchange is, is required for, for all mucosal. So the whole purpose of them physiologically is to communicate with the outside world. So you, you need some way of, uh, of getting information across, and that's the firewall idea. But then you need something that, uh, that protects the host from, from all the bad things that can happen if too many of these things or the wrong things get across. So we have a few different projects, um, and I'll just highlight one of them today, is looking at regulatory T cells. So this is a, a paper that was recently accepted in Frontiers Immunology, uh, led by a postdoc in my group, Al. And Al developed uh, this uh, uh, T-reg panel uh, that we used in cervical cytobrush samples uh, in women from Nairobi, and this was a cross-sectional study um, where we uh, we took the uh, uh, cytobrushes and uh, and you know counted. We looked at proportions of T-regs and also counted all, all the cells in the sample. And the hypothesis is that endocervical T-regs may may control genital inflammation. And so we define T-regs in, in the usual way uh, by C25 expression and CD127 negative. We, can, we also look at FOXP3 and CTLA4. And then in the same panel, we can also look at uh, TH17 or TH17 like cells based on CCR6 and CD161 expression. So, one of the interesting things here is that the T regs are more frequent in the endocervix compared to the blood, although there is a correlation between the different compartments. And we see high, relatively high expression of both FOXP3 and CTLA4. And CTLA4 is actually higher, higher expressed in the cervix than it is in the blood. We didn't see any correlation with the microbiome, so we did 16S sequencing in the, in the same samples from the same participant, soft cup samples. And we see the usual sort of microbiome groups. Uh, this is the lactobacillus dominant group here in yellow. These are more of the mixed and Gardnerella groups in, uh, in multicolors, uh, Gardnerella is in purple. And you can see that the frequency of T-Rex does not differ by these three clusters. And actually the, the frequency or the total number of C4 cells also didn't, uh, did not differ by microbiome cluster. However, where we did see some differences is in inflammatory cytokines. So if you look at T-regs by, by tertile, these are women with the most T-regs and the cervical T-regs here, is number three. You can see in, in, for each of these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, the uh, expression of that cytokine was the lowest in women with, with the most uh, T-regs. And in some cases, it's relatively dose dependent uh, from tertile one to two to three. Uh, we also, uh, at the same time, found that endocircle T regs were associated with lower number of HIV target cells. And this is, again, counting all the cells on, on the cytobrush. So we acquire the entire cytobrush sample and, and use this as a, as, a, as a variable. And there's almost a, a one log difference in CD4 cells from the uh, lowest T reg tertiles to the highest. Similar um, uh, direction of a trend for TH17, although that wasn't uh, significant. So just to summarize these data, T regs are, are frequent in the end of cervix, uh, and there's a few other studies that have, have, have suggested a similar thing. They expressed high levels of uh, FOXP3 and CTLA4. We didn't find any correlations with vaginal microbiota, although we might be underpowered to look at it the way we did uh, by by cluster, and maybe a larger study might find might, might find some differences. 
However, we did we did see inverse inverse correlations with both pro-inflammatory cytokine concentrations and the number of C4 T cells in the endocervix. Both of these are thought to promote HIV infection risk. So maybe by augmenting or having increased uh, Treg activity, this might be able to control inflammation and, and, re and reduce the risk of HIV infection. So this is a study that we're currently uh, expanding on now. Um, so this is just a, a pictorial way of, of looking at that. Um, this, this has been our model for, for the last several years now um, uh, of how genital inflammation might uh, increase HIV infection risk. So basically you have increased uh, cytokines, this leads to uh, immune cell recruitment. Some of these are HB target cells. Some of them might be cells such as neutrophils, which can break down the mucosal barrier. And then of course, when the barrier is broken down, that's a form of injury that can lead to more cytokine production and then you can get this cyclical sort of uh, relationship here. I'm not gonna talk about it much today, but we've we spent some time uh, looking at different stimuli that can lead to increased cytokines. And I've listed some of them here on the slide. Obviously, some of these are microbial, such as the microbiome or, or, or sexually transmitted infections. Uh, there's intravaginal practices, there's contraceptives, there's sexual activity itself can, can lead to inflammation. So these are all different things that contribute towards um, having more cytokines. Uh, this was our initial um, finding from five years ago in, the, in this Arnold et al. paper, uh, where we looked at if you stratify women by the number of ele elevated mucosal cytokines, uh, in the in the general tract, uh, how many more cells you got? And you can see that there's kind of a after you have three or more elevated uh, cytokines, you get this increase in, in cells that's fairly uh, consistent. But but not as many studies have sort of directly looked at what influences the number of cells you have. Obviously, inflammation is one of the things, but are there other things that might uh, influence the number of cells you find in, in these cytobrush samples? And so we looked at this in the CRISA 008 study uh, in, in South Africa. So um, if people are familiar, this is uh, HIV uninfected uh, women from CRISA 004 who were given post-trial access to transfer gel. And they were randomized either getting the, the gel as if it was a clinical trial or uh, in a family planning clinic. Uh, we did a prospective uh, cohort analysis of 181 women sampled about six times each. And we correlated uh, immune parameters together with each other using linear next models. And we looked at uh, a bunch of other variables that might predict immune cell uh, concentration. And then we also had 24 HIV seroconversions. So we did a uh, Cox regression to look at uh, whether cells predicted the, the risk of HIV infection. And we measured uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines like we've done in previous studies. These proteins called MMPs, which are, have been shown to break down the mucosal barrier. And then we did our, uh, the usual sort of T cell profiling in cytobrush samples. And so this is just looking at a, a few of the parameters. I'm not, it's uh, hard to show them all on the screen, but, uh, but this is looking at lymphocytes, CD4 cells, and CD4 cells that express the CR5. And what we did is we divided the women into never having genital inflammation, always having genital inflammation, and then sometimes having. So at some visits they had it, and some visits they didn't. And we looked at the number of cells uh, we found in, in the cytobrush. And in general, if, the, if there was genital inflammation at the visit, uh, we see more cells than if general inflammation was not present at the visit. Again, there's, there's a fairly wide distribution. So it was, this, this is showing every single visit in the study, all 800 and 824. So uh, it's a lot of data points. And uh, you, know, you get some people uh, at, at the ends of the distribution, obviously. But on average, you get more cells if general inflammation is present, whether it's always present or, or sometimes present. We, some of them, we modeled this with the linear mix models. And uh, again, the strongest predictor of cells was, was general inflammation defined by cytokines. And that was associated with having more cells. Um, there was an inverse trend, which wasn't significant for, for Nugent score. So women with higher Nugent score had lower cells, which is uh, the opposite of what some people might think, but that's what, uh, that's what it was. Um, recent sex, uh, although le less than 30 days, not that recent, was associated with fewer cells. And then SDIs were associated with, uh, with more cells. And this is looking at the total number of CD4 cells per log 10 number of CD4 cells per cytobrush. So inflammation is really the best predictor of, uh, of cytokines, uh, or of the number of cells in the general tract in the study. What was a bit surprising is that uh, there was no association with HIV outcome. And uh, I'll get to some of the caveats of this in a second. But this is looking at a number of different CD4 phenotypes and a number of different CD8 phenotypes. And you can see that either in an unadjusted model or in an adjusted model, 
Uh, most of these hazard ratios are below one, except for this one. Uh, not, not significant for most of them, but the only significant finding was that CD8 cells expressing HLA-DR were actually associated with protection, so reduced risk of HIV infection. But a lot of these trend in the same direction. So in summary of this study, um, cytokine inflammation correlated with the number of endocircal cells and MMPs, which I didn't show, but the, there was very strong correlation with MMPs and inflammation. And this is very similar to what our previous work that we published five years ago. So in a way, it was nice to see that there's some consistency there. It was a bit surprising to me that there was no endocervical C4 associations with HIV acquisition and actually some trends towards protection. And I guess the question I would ask with these data um, is, is it the number of target cells that matters or maybe target cell access? So maybe if women have a, a breakdown in the mucosal barrier, the virus might be able to access the same amount of target cells and maybe target cells are not associated with the HIV outcome. Although I think, I, to be fair, I think we need a lot more data to really be able to uh, conclude that for certain. And then and the cervical CD8 cells expressing HLA-DR showed a modest uh, association with reduced HIV acquisition. And actually there's been some papers on, on suggesting that this subset is, is a really good CD8 subset in terms of antiviral activity. So that's something that could also be explored further. And major caveats, I think, is a small number of infections and it really need replication to, to look at more endpoints. Uh, the cohort is selected on being remaining HIV negative for several years. So the cohort is actually a little bit older than some of the other South African cohorts we studied. And that's because to, to be eligible for 008, you have to be net negative all the way through 004 and actually a couple of years after 004. But there's another thing that I wanted to discuss next, and that's that the cyber brush might not represent tissue cells. And this is something that a lot of people have brought up, uh, including reviewers of my papers. Uh, over the years, so uh, it is something that we are, are, are exploring further. So in terms of vaginal tract um, sampling methods, this is the female reproductive tract here. A lot of the sampling happens around the, the cervix, which is the entrance to the uterus. And this is a picture of a, of a cervix actually from this website called the, the Beautiful Cervix Project, which encourages women to take pictures of their, of their cer services. Um, I found this in Googling. Googling cervix, which is a dangerous thing to be doing at work, of course. Um, but the, anyways, you can get a variety of different samples from this, from this, from this site. So we do a lot of stuff with cervical lavage and soft cup. Um, it's a good source for doing some kinds of analyses. Uh, Cytobrush goes into the cervical os and collects the cells that are kind of lining the, the entry, this entry into the, into the uterus. And then we and others have taken ectocervical biopsies. And we usually get one from the upper and uh, right and left quadrant of, of the endocervix. And actually, quite a few years ago, we published a paper with Sean and Florian looking at uh, what, kind, what types of cells you get from these different types of samples. So we've done these studies in, in both Nairobi and in Winnipeg, and that's an example of one of the, one of the biopsies. This is Wendy, who's one of the technicians in Nairobi. Who, uh, in this particular study, we, we uh, put all the biopsies into OCT to do imaging, and we, uh, we're currently working on that. I, I don't have any data to show you on that. But the other thing that we do is uh, we do flow cytometry. So this is uh, some particip healthy participants we enrolled in Winnipeg, where we can directly compare uh, CD8 and C4 cells in biopsies and cider brushes. And one interesting thing we found is that if you look at these markers, CD103 and CD69, you can see that uh, you get much higher double positive populations for both CD4 cells and for CD8 cells in biopsies compared to uh, cider brush. And these are markers of, uh, of tissue resident memory cells. And if you look at a, a number of people, you can see that there's a very significant increase in, in the number of tissue resident uh, C4 cells you get in, the, in biopsy compared to CMC. You, you do get a couple of people with higher uh, populations in the cervix, but for the most part, you get very close to, uh, to zero. Again, so th these are tissue resident memory cells. So if you're looking at a real tissue sample, you expect to find more of them. So this is kind of, uh, kind of logical. And we're currently trying to, uh, to do some single cell uh, RNA sequencing to uh, understand this better, mostly using the 10X genomic system. And we finally, finally appear to have got that to work. So uh, that's data I'm excited to look at when it becomes ready. <laughs> so again, these are tissue resident uh, memory cells or TRM. And um, for a long time, uh, memory phenotype has been linked to migration. This is the original T effector memory and central memory paradigm, which is now more than 20 years old. But ever since this time, people suspected that some of these uh, cells and tissue uh, actually don't recirculate. And uh, TRM is not to be confused with the Fika, Fika Road Mall. Uh, actually, I also was walking around last night and saw TRM on one of the buses in Seattle. So 
the shows that TRM are everywhere. Um, so, so this, these uh, basically uh, the literature on these started really increasing around 2011, 2012, and people in Seattle have done some some of the important studies on, on this subset as well. Um, it's been investigated more for CD8 cells than for CD4 cells. Definitely for CD8 cells, these have been shown to have immediate to antigen specific factor functions. So they can be cytotoxic, they can release chemokines that uh, attract other cells to tissue. For CD4, it's anticipated, I think, shown to some degree that they might have more diverse functions, just like CD4 cells have more diverse functions than CD8 cells. And so this is an, a, a subset we're interested in studying in, in a variety of different uh, uh, mucosa. And our interest in this actually came from our studies on the gut helping integrin L4 bit 7. And we showed a few years ago that uh, women who had higher L4 bit 7 expression on their CD4 cells uh, had higher rates of HIV acquisition and uh, more rapid disease progression. And also in collaboration with colleagues in Thailand, we showed that these cells are, are, are depleted from the gut during the early fubic stages and not replenished by heart. Um, in the blood, so this is a paper we, that was accepted last year. Um, we found that alpha 4 beta 7 cells during the early fubic stages uh, contain higher levels of HIV, integrated HIV DNA. And um, that's shown here. So in fubic stage two and three, you can see there's as much as 10 times more HIV DNA in, in L4 beta, or beta 7 high compared to beta 7 negative cells. Again, this, these are both memory subsets. So you're comparing memory to memory, but just based on beta 7 high expression. But it does suggest that, that, that these cells are important to uh, HIV target cell population. But I think what's, what's more interesting potentially is that, um, that these cells we know home to the gut, and we know that a lot of the cells that home to the gut expressing alpha 4 beta 7 will switch to alpha E beta 7. And that's CD103. So this is this tissue uh, retention marker. And actually, so the question we came upon when we first started this project is could the alpha 4 beta 7 depletion we see in the gut be instead switching from alpha 4 beta 7 to alpha E beta 7? And, uh, this cartoon here is just showing that the, the integrin pairing patterns are, are restricted. So alpha-4 can only pair with uh, beta-7 or beta-1. And actually, this turns out to be an important uh, regulatory mechanism for which of these is expressed. And then beta-7 can only pair with alpha-4 alpha and alpha E. And so people have looked at uh, C4 TRM in the context of HIV in, in vaginal tissue and adipose tissue. And I think some HIV studies are coming along now uh, in other tissues. But uh, at the time that we were coming up with this idea that there was very limited data from the gut and lymph nodes. And these are major sites of HIV uh, replication. So obviously interesting to, uh, to look at. So again, in collaboration with, collaboration with Elk Schutz in, uh, in Thailand and the US military HIV research program, we looked at uh, uh, expression of, or basically the frequency of TRM in the sequoid colon biopsies. So we look at CD4 cells, we define TRM as, as the double expressing population, so 69 and 103, but, but a lot of people think that 69 positive cells not expressing 103 could also be potential TRM. So that's what we're calling the potential TRM. And then these double negative here are the, the non-TRM. So we can look at CCR5 expression on, on these cells. And indeed, you get a lot more CCR5 expression both on the potential TRM and especially on the, uh, on the TRM. And a variety of people have shown that these are actually more HIV susceptible uh, in, in vitro. So what we did is then we, again, in this Thai cohort, which is really interesting because they enroll people during acute HIV infection and then treat them immediately and then follow them over time. So you can look at people with, with very small reservoirs. And so we looked at people treated for more than six months. And we looked at uh, how many CD4 TRM they had. And what was interesting is if you look at the proportion of CD4 cells or the counts, you can see that there's a, a decreased number of these CD, uh, CD4 TRM in the ART uh, treated patients compared to the HIV negative. Uh, for potential TRM, and actually for proportions, it goes in the opposite direction, but for counts, it's also not significant, but, uh, but it seems to be a slight reduction. And if you compare this to CD4, um, obviously people don't, don't uh, replenish all their CD4 cells in the gut during treatment either. But uh, in comparison, there's a 22% decrease in gut CD4, but a 64% decrease in CD4 TRM. And so one, one thing we're looking at now is, is uh, what the implications are for persistent inflammation on heart. So if these cells are really important in maintaining homeostasis in the gut, their, their depletion during heart could potentially uh, contribute towards, you know, leaky gut barrier and, uh, and stuff like that. So this is, some, this is ongoing work now that we're doing. So just a summary of this, these TRM data, um, I think that there's really importance of tissue residency. Um, 
is becoming more and more uh, understood in the immune system and a, a really a large portion of the immune system uh, does live in tissue and, and doesn't ever reach circulation. And there was a very nice paper from Dave Mass, this group that, uh, that looks at this in a real wide, uh, in a really holistic way. Uh, we found differences in cyberbrush versus biopsy sampling in the female genital tract. And this is work we're currently expanding to understand these cell populations better, the ones that are sort of in tissue versus the ones that are on the surface of the tissue. Uh, in the gut, uh, HIV-infected L4-7 cells may home to the tissue and upregulate CD1 L3. There's some evidence for their preferential depletion and or incomplete uh, reconstitution during ART. Uh, and this, this could be important both for tissue reservoirs, so we're now currently looking for virus in these cells and in tissue, but also implications for kind of impaired homeostasis, residual inflammation that's associated with uh, even with early treatment. I'm just going to wrap up um, quickly uh, to talk about some of the COVID-19 studies we've, we've sort of done reluctantly. Um, this cartoon here is reminding me that I'm switching uh, because of, um, which is important to remember. So there was an interesting um, opinion piece that came out last year, um, kind of uh, you know highlighting what the different roles of T cells could be in, in COVID-19. And uh, um, so, you know, you have no cross-reactive T-cell memory versus, you know, different kinds of T-cell responses. But what our attention was this idea of TRM in the upper reproductive tract could really uh, decrease the viral load, maybe prevent the virus from disseminating into, into the lung, uh, maybe be associated with asymptomatic infection. And uh, this seemed like a, a, an important thing to look at. And at the same time, vaccines were becoming available. So we wanted to know, are these, uh, are these TRM uh, induced by vaccines? And uh, so this project in its earliest days, um, you know, someone asked us, can you do flow cytometry on, on nasal pharyngeal swabs? And we didn't know, but it was an excuse to do something during lockdown. So we, uh, we, we did flow cytometry on them and we were very surprised actually that the nose is full of T cells. So this is like a classic lymphocyte population that you see in flow cytometry. A lot of these cells express CD45, which is a pan lymphocyte marker. And a lot of these CD45 cells are in fact T cells expressing CD3. And we got a range of several thousand uh, uh, T cells uh, in the nose. And that doesn't sound very impressive to someone who does blood immunology, but this is actually more cells than you find in, in, in the cervix. So for us, it was like, hey, now we can do a study. That, that's going to be fun. And then it turned out you need to use the right swab. And so if you compare these two different swabs right here, I won't tell you the, the whole story, but basically they look the same, but you get very different immune profiles from these from these swabs, right? So this is this is the the swab that we used for the, our initial study, and this is the one we're used now going forward. Uh, it's a bit more bristly, it's the, this BD swab here, so it might be, maybe it gets a little bit further into the mucosa than, uh, than the other one does. This is kind of like a fluffy Copan flock swab. So this flock swab is really good for getting uh, epithelial cells. So a lot of cells, these cells express this uh, EPCAM, which is an epithelial cell marker. Um, but the uh, this BD mini flex swab is really good for getting T cells. And you do get a few uh, T cells or a few immune cells in, in some individuals with this flux well, but it's not very consistent. Whereas the, the there's fairly good consistency in terms of cell recovery in, in the BD mini flex tip swab, which also during the pandemic was very hard to get one's hands on because it was like every single swab was in the, was in uh, high demand. But we managed to get a big box, so we were able to do a study. So if you phenotype the cells, uh, a high proportion are uh, TRM cells. So for CD4, it's a bit more variable. So this person here doesn't have very many. This person has a lot. This person kind of has an intermediate amount. But for CD8 cells, most of the cells are both 69 positive and 103 positive. We also found uh, TH17 cells, and we also found uh, uh, regulatory T cells as well. So all the different T cell subsets you'd expect are there, and a high proportion are uh, seem to be seem to be tissue resident. So we did a study in, in 21 healthy donors, and we've now since expanded it, but this is the initial data set we had. Um, two of them had prior COVID, so this is just looking at their, at their antibody responses to the COVID vaccine, and the two people with prior COVID are, are in red. And so one of these people was positive for uh, nucleocapsid, so a sign of um, previous infection. The other person was actually negative for nucleocapsid, which was interesting. And, but both of them, you can see that they have higher antibody responses uh, after dose one, that kind of plateau between dose one and dose two. And this has now been shown by, by, by quite a few different people. So what we did is we, uh, we looked at this group, which are all sort of adults, um, 
We looked at the baseline just before they got the first dose of vaccine. Then we looked at uh, visits two and three, which are 10 to 14 days after doses one and two, and this is the Pfizer uh, BNT vaccine. And so what was interesting is in the nasal mucosa is we got we saw an expansion of CD8 TRM, uh, about a half log increase from visit one to visit three. And this is both for the CD69 double positive 103 and the 69 positive 103 negative, um, but mostly for the, for the double positive population. So even though most of the cells in there proportionally are TRM, the number of these cells increases uh, with, with, with vaccination. In the blood, we see the opposite trend and I'm not, Fully understand why, but you, you do see some of these TRM phenotype cells in the blood uh, at, at low percentages. Uh, but after vaccination, these cells really decrease, suggesting maybe they home out of the blood to the to the nose. We also looked at uh, stimulating the nasal cells with uh, spike peptides, and initially we looked two months post vaccination uh, using a four hour stimulation because we were afraid that the um, cells would all die overnight. And we did this unpaired, so we 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 randomized people to either be stimulated with the peptide or, or not stimulated. And you can see that there are some increases in CD107, uh, and CD40 ligand, uh, perforin. It's not definitely not in everybody, so some people might be responding and some people might not be. Uh, but you do see some evidence of, uh, of immune responses there. And now we've recently uh, done this uh, in an overnight stim with spike peptides, splitting the samples between unstimulated and stimulated so we get a paired analysis. And again, we saw this uh, increase in CD107, suggesting that these cells are cytotoxic. Uh, we did not see the same increase in uh, CD40 ligand, which is one of these AIM assay markers. Uh, but it does suggest that the, these cells are recognizing uh, spike peptide, at least in, in, for certain types of responses. We're now expanding this to older adults. So we've enrolled, uh, we're enrolling up to 50. I think we've enrolled 38 so far, uh, adults over 65. And we're looking, uh, pre and post third shot, now that the now that older adults are all getting third shots. We have an IRB approval to look at children between the ages of five and 17. We're trying to do a study in Uganda, but it's very difficult because the vaccine rollout there is all, all over the place. Uh, we're collaborating with a lot of different people who are looking at a, a lot of different other types of responses, both systemic and mucosal. And we're also looking at TCR usage in the, in the nose. So we're able to get TCR data out of around 1,000 to 2,000 cells. And what, one thing that was interesting, uh, people in my lab labeled this older folks. I don't know if you exactly know why, but uh, I guess it works. Um, there's some, diff some differences in, in cell frequencies. So uh, C3 cells as a proportion of CD45 are much less than the older people, even though they have similar counts of CD3 cells. So suggesting that they just have more CD45 positive cells in the nose in general. So you can see that there's an increase in C3 negative cells. I don't know why, I don't know enough about immunology by age to understand this, but uh, that's what we found so far. And actually, I don't I can't explain this either. So um, we found that if you stimulate these um, cells with uh, spike peptides, you see the opposite for CD107, you actually see decrease in CD107 after spike peptide stimulation. Again, I have no idea why, but uh, that's what we found so far. And we're really excited to look at the responses in children because we're expecting those to be, uh, to be bigger than the adults or better than the adults. So just a summary of the nasal T cells. So there's very limited literature in humans, particularly for the upper respiratory tracts, uh, using a convenient sampling method. So people have looked at, you know, thrown away cervical or surgical tissue. People have looked at BAL, but none of those are very con convenient for doing a longitudinal study. So we think the NP swabs are maybe a neat way to do this. We saw an increase in CD8 TRM and TH17-like cells. I, I didn't show this, but the TH17-like CD4 cells also increased following um, Pfizer BNT vaccination. CD8 cells express cytotoxic markers in response to spike peptide, but this could vary in different subpopulations. This is something we're following up now. And just a hypothesis, I guess, is that upper, upper, upper respiratory tract T cells can be important for uh, protection against infection and transmission and may limit, limit the penetration of the virus into the, into the lung. And I, and I think a lot of people are, now that we know the vaccines really prevent against severe outcomes, but not as much of, uh, against transmission and infection, uh, perhaps this aspect could be enhanced by uh, by mucosal vaccination to get better responses in the in the nose. So uh, that's a bit of a whirlwind tour, but uh, I'd just like to thank every, everyone in my lab who contributed to this, to especially Al, who did a lot of the studies I presented today. Uh, he's been a really great postdoc in the lab, and then Frank, who's doing the HIV phylogenetic stuff. 
we have a lot of different collaborations. I'm not going to go through all the different uh, people, but uh, working in, in a lot of different countries. Um, obviously, the study volunteers for all the different studies, the, the funders. Uh, this is the lab here right before the pandemic hit when we didn't know what social distancing was. Um, and this is Al, and this is Frank. And then here we are here, um, looking more frazzled on Zoom um, over time. And I'm happy to, uh, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions. Oh, I'm also uh, recruiting postdocs and, and uh, PhD students. So if you wanna, if you wanna come to one of the world's 100 greatest places, <laughs> you can uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks. I don't know why the screen went black. Yeah. That's a screen. Oh. Yeah, it's back. So, um, while are there any in person questions while I figure out, get the chat? Um, uh, yeah. Did you, uh, so, look, you mostly focused on the endocervical cells with regards to the HIV genital tract mucosa. Um, have you looked compared to vaginal cells? In, any, in terms of the Treg, you know, prevalence and the other phenotypes you were looking at. Yeah, so we, we haven't done a lot of that because it basically that early study we did with Sean and Flora, and you, you don't get any very many cells from any kind of any kind of uh, like soft cup or um, or CDL. It's just not a very consistent way to isolate cells, so you wouldn't even be, even be able to do the phenotyping of cells. But cytobrush and. Um, so we prepared cytobrush and biopsy. The only trouble is biopsy is really hard to do on any scale. Like you can't do a longitudinal study with multiple. I mean, you sort of have to do it in a very targeted way because there's no potential safety issues. Yeah. And it's hard to do in the highest risk indiv individuals because it obviously causes an injury, right? We don't want that injury to, to lead to any sort of conversion. So we've, we've done that more to just describe the immunology of it and, and not to really correlate with any kind of outcome. So we've relied mostly on, sorry, on set of rush samples for doing any, any of those sort of perspective bigger studies. Any difference in the um, T reg abundance in the endocervix based on HSV2 status? Good question. Um, we haven't uh, we haven't run the HSV2 serology yet, um, but we have the samples to do that, so that's something we should definitely do. Um, I don't, it, our sample size is probably too small to look at actually HSV2 protection, but uh, the in a sex worker population, HSV2 is like 80 to 90%. So that, that kind of study might have to be done in a lower risk population where the HSV2 is more like 50 50 or something like that. Um, and in the, in the Caprisa study, we looked at, we have good HSV2 data in that study, but we didn't look at T-Rex. So definitely something we could do going forward. So we, we're just, there's a number of different cohorts. Now we're expanding the T-Rex study into so we'll have a lot more data in the next few years one other kind of related question um is there a, is there a correlation between t-reg abundance and t-cell activation in the cervix i think you just showed like numbers of t-cells right not non t-reg t-cells yeah um we didn't have so we didn't have hla dr and 38 in that panel because we wanted to have the th 7 t-cells so uh, in nairobi our flow cytometry is a bit limited for colors so uh, we're at around 10. So by the time you do all the lineage markers and everything, it's hard to do it much, much more. It's a bit off the wall question, but um, do you know whether the Treg um, cells are correlated um, in the standard cervix are correlated with um, history of preterm labor or? Um, yeah. Um, so there was, I forget what it was now. Um, it's not preterm labor, but uh, I think with um, uh, miscarriage. Higher T -reg. higher levels of T -reg. I think so. It's in the paper. I forget, I forget which direction I'm now, but the, and there were some trends. I think in a bigger study too, there were some trends with punch, type of contraceptive, which I think might be borne out if you did a bigger study. Yeah, like ours was just a little bit too small to, to be able to really subdivide the groups up. Um, but there was definitely a trend towards T reg differences in women using injectable contraceptives versus not. So okay. I had a related question to Jenny's actually about sure. uh, herpes virus detection in general beyond HSV and like CMV, like if you saw that in any of those inflammation um, studies. Yeah. CMV, uh, it's not something that we've looked at, but I, I know it's, uh, I know Rupert Call has looked at CMV in some of his studies. So always something that we should look at, but I haven't, we haven't looked at it as much. I think we have a uh, question from the Zoom attendees. Oh yeah, how do I, how do I find it? Yeah, just 
with that one. So, oh, yeah. Uh, it's an anonymous attendee. Okay. <laughs> I yeah, no, I mean, I think I think that's an interesting avenue to pursue. I mean, I haven't, I don't know how causal vaccines are necessarily uh, designed. I mean, the, the main one that people talk about is flu mist, right? For, for flu, but there's really, really not that many more mucosal vaccines other than like, you know, live polio and stuff like that. Um, but uh, so yeah, I guess you'd have to, you'd have to test whether something like an mRNA vaccine could be, could be given uh, nasally and what would happen. I don't know, I think that'd be an interesting thing to explore. Uh -huh. Sure. Sorry, not to try not to dominate here. Um, so I thought your the nasal swab study was super cool, um, and maybe I just missed this, but how soon after the vaccine was the sampling done? Yeah, we we, we aimed for twelve days. We allowed a window of ten to fourteen because we wanted the we wanted the peak response for doing the enumeration of cells, and um, but then we've now sampled people two months post, four months post, six months post, and now. It's interesting with COVID research, you start to go with the flow. So now people are getting boosts. So now we're doing boost studies. It's like you basically just wait to see whatever public health gets rolled out and then you just adapt to the starting response. <laughs> yeah, so we've, we've, we've now, now done lots of, um, and like in children, we wanted to do the longitudinal study, but the pediatricians basically told us that you're never going to get a kid who signs up for more than one of these swabs. <laughs> so in the kids, we're going to focus on one to two months post second dose. Um, and have you looked at like T cell? Like numbers over time, then you know beyond the twelve days post vaccine, and like do the numbers probably don't stay up, right? Um, yeah, it, it gets tricky because in the in the later sampling time points, we didn't want to focus on enumeration; we wanted to focus on antigen specificity. And obviously, if you stimulate the cells, permeabilize them, all these are other things, you're not going to be able to have the same ability to count them, right? So, I don't think we have a clear answer to whether they come down or not. I mean, something we talked about doing, but we had to sort of decide. Uh, what we're going to use each sample for, and we thought the antigen specificity was, was more important. So uh, I don't know. Do you, think, do you think the majority of the cells are antigen specific, or do you think they're just like bystander activated, or you know? Yeah, that's a good question. I, mean, I don't have a clear answer for it. I mean, e even in the blood, not everyone makes very strong T cell responses to these vaccines. So we have a bit of blood data now too, and and so it, maybe it's not surprising you don't see an increase in like. Any of the markers we're looking at in every single person. So maybe we're thinking now we should be looking at a sort of a responder, non-responder kind of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, on average things go up, but it, I don't, I don't know if that's again. It could, you know, I think you're right. It could be bystanders a little bit. This is where we hoped to T cell receptor studies might help to to look at this a little bit because we could look at whether certain TCRs are expanding over time after vaccination. So. No, this is kind of, again, a little bit off the wall, but um, it's not clear to me why getting the uh, an mRNA vaccine would hone T cells to the nasal muco or respiratory mucosa. Uh, has, is there any data to suggest, um, for example, looking at both respiratory and genital mucosa in the same individuals to see whether you see homing to both sides of the general mucosal homing or? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question, and we thought about this at the beginning of the study. So, if you look at the like really potent vaccines, like the live attenuated vaccines, they distribute cells all around the body, right? So, it's part of the vaccine response program is that you upregulate homing markers, and then the cells home to all the different places. And that's the way the immune system works generally, too, right? So, um, we thought you know our mRNA vaccines seem pretty potent, so not it's not on a question that they would do this. If you look at the literature. Literature will say that you need um, you need the uh, mucosal vaccination to get strong mucosal responses, but this I don't think that means you don't get any mucosal responses. So it would be interesting to look at a mucosal vaccine to see if you get bigger mucosal responses, but I'm not necessarily surprised that you see the responses there. Um, so you'd expect that if you check the genital tract, and you'd see responses there too. Yeah, I think so. The mRNA vaccine, the COVID vaccine. Yeah, I think so. A question from Larry. Okay. Uh, Larry, Corey. Yeah. Larry, you should be able to. All right. Sorry. Um, uh, first of all, I'll just compliment you um, on the talk and to continue to plug away. I mean, I think trying to correlate the frequency or function of TRMs with sort of prevention or clinical outcomes is a difficult um, 
thing to do, and I applaud um, you doing it. Um, uh, I think you just your last question of just sort of looking at um, genetic approaches of the TCRs to um, whether you for SARS-CoV-2 can get adaptive to to work with you. Um, I think provide could provide some in, insight as to whether it's the quantity and or the quality of the immune response, as well as um, what happens with reinfection and um, you know what what kind of um, uh, T cell repertoire one sees. And um, I, I think as the variant enters the world, um, uh, understanding that both from the vaccinated person and the previously infected person will be of great interest and would, you know, and I, I think you've established the mechanism, the, the, the operational mechanisms to do this. And I um, would hope you would be able to you know, continue to do this. So um, my question was really just uh, um, not really a question, just more of a comment that I um, uh, enjoyed this immensely and think you're generating um, data that has great applicability to understanding of the virus that is going to be with us for a long period of time. Thanks, I appreciate that. One last one on that on that note of the variant du jour. There's also a lot of interest in understanding how they they emerge, and I wonder if there's ways for us to look at that in uh, immunocompromised populations. So you have um, these populations from Africa that you do like, serially sample over time, and I wonder what are your thoughts on sort of yeah yeah. No, that's an interesting question. I mean. Um, the, the former postdoc, Aida, who's still in South Africa, has uh, looked at some immune responses in HIV positive versus negative people. And, and there are some sort of interesting differences um, in those responses. And But I, I just think that most of the time, that's not going to grow a variant out. So, you know, you might see slight differences, but that uh, is not enough to, if, 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 it, if that is what grows variants out, it doesn't happen very often, right? Like, it's happened a handful of times. It could be maybe you get a lot of variants and maybe not all, all of those variants are fit enough to replicate. So I think that is an interesting thing to look at. Um, and people, I think people in, in, the, in those settings with a lot of people on ARTS, um, HIV infected people can, can look at that. Thanks again. This was a great Thank talk. You. Thanks to everybody for joining on Zoom and in person. So good to see everyone's faces. <laughs>